Hello, good morning. We are here in the last presentation of this forum. And I'm grateful for the Lord who has given us this opportunity to share together what we have studied so far. The topic that I'm going to discuss is oneness, trueness, and threeness revelation of God. A little bit word words. Let me discuss first why we are here on this forum. Let me look at the have a short historical background of the problem of why we have this forum. Early Adventists did not differentiate between biblical facts and their classical interpretation as conditioned by Greek philosophical ideas. An anti-Trinitarian sentiment was pervasive during the first decade of Adventist history. The rejection of the classical theological interpretation of the doctrine of Trinity by some 70 Adventist authors do not necessarily entail a rejection of biblical revelation about Trinity because they reject the interpretation, not the biblical facts themselves. The classical doctrine is frequently rejected on the basis of a very weak arguments such as that the word trinity is not a biblical or that the doctrine is against our God-given sense and reason. Sometimes the doctrine of trinity is rejected on the basis of wrong arguments such as, for instance, that it teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person rather than impersonal influence. Let's look at the pervasive view of the Holy Spirit of most denomination, and I have listed 10 that are that were emerging together with Adventism, Jehovah's Witnesses. The Holy Spirit is impersonal to the Mormon. The Holy Spirit is impersonal. The Christian science. The Holy Spirit is the divine science. The Church of God, led by Armstrong, impersonal influence and force. Christadelphians, it is an unseen power. The oneness Pentecostal, it is one God reveals himself in three modes, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The unification, church, the Holy Spirit is a feminine nature. Jesus was not God. God is both positive and negative, male and female. Unity is school of Trinity. The Holy Spirit is active expression of God's law. Say in theology, the Holy Spirit is absent in their belief. And the Christian connection where James White and Joseph Bates were members, the Holy Spirit is not divine, is not a person. So with this pervasive understanding of the Holy Spirit at the time, it is no wonder why many of the early pioneers did not yet understood fully the revelation of God. Here are six reasons why many pioneers were rejecting the doctrine of Trinitarianism. First, they did not see evidence for three persons in the Godhead. Second, they thought that the doctrine of Trinity made the Father and the Son identical. Third, they believed that the doctrine of Trinity teaches the existence of three gods. Number four, the doctrine of Trinity would destroy the value of the atonement. Number five, since Jesus is called the Son of God, prove that he must be of recent origin 
than God the Father. The number six, the variety of expressions used to refer the Holy Spirit indicates that it could not be a person. Why? He is against a God-given sins and reasons. That's their understanding. But we are warned, we modern last the events and last the people of God. Ellen White said again and again, I have shown that in the past experiences of God's people are not to be counted as dead facts. We are not to treat the record of these experiences as we would treat last year's almanac. The record is to be kept in mind for history will repeat itself. In the future, Satan, superstition will assume no forms. False theories clothed with the garments of light will be presented to God's people. Thus, Satan will try to deceive, if possible, the very elite. Publishing Ministry 175. Here, we find statement of Ellen White. More than 100 years, look. The question of personality of the Holy Spirit that has been a question in the early Adventist church history now becomes a problem. Beginning it is a trickle, and now it's a torrent. It divides the church. I have been shown that many who profess to have the knowledge of the present truth know not what they believe. When the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who find upon examining the position they hold that they, there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until tested does they know not the great ignorance. And there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until controversy arises, they do not know their weaknesses. They will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will ship separating the chaff from the way. It's clear. Many, we believe, we assume to believe that we understand, but when controversy arises, we lost. We cannot. We are handicapped how to handle. Let me share with you in this presentation the revelation of God in the Bible. This is not about revelation, about his nature, about history, conscience, and people. It's a different. A revelation of the Godhead. And I propose five because when I read the Bible, it seems to be consistent. So what are the five ways that the Bible reveals God? Number one, the Bible reveals it in a term, God or Father. And I call it the oneness of God. Number two, it reveals the Father, Son, and Spirit or Holy Spirit. Since there are three entities, I call it the threeness of God. Number three, it reveals through Father and Son. I term it twoness of God. And since it is repeated, a combination of revelation, Father and Spirit is part of the twoness of God's revelation. The last, it reveals through Jesus and Spirit. Now, the first three are prominently discussed, while the last two are taken for granted, seldom found in theological books. Tonis of God is a preeminent usage, both the Old and New Testament. With these five proposals that I have, I want to share with you that this is really the modus operandi of God's revelation according to the Bible. Let me explain first this term. 
I borrowed this term from somewhere and someone else, but I describe it in my own personal way to help those who are not theologically trained to understand the Word of God that seems illogical, confusing, mind-boggling to ordinary readers of the Bible. By using this term, I tried my best to correlate them in five ways of revelation of God, which I understand as consistent all throughout the Bible. So what I mean by oneness means a state or quality being one person. It refers to God the Father as a separate person in a given biblical context. Two-ness means state or quality being two distinct persons of understanding God in the context of the Father and Son, Father and Spirit, and Christ and Spirit in a biblical context. Threeness means a state or quality of being three person or the plurality of one God. In the context where the passage that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit appeared. And the term Godhead means the fullness of the nature, essence, attributes, and characteristic of divinity. Let us look at first Ellen White and the Bible understanding of the term Godhead. Let us first understand the term Godhead as is used in Romans 1.20, Colossians 2.9, where the Greek word theotes is used and translated Godhead, which means the fullness of God or fullness of divinity. It is having the same essential nature, attributes, quality, essence, substance of God, and co-eternal and coexistence. It is interesting that Ellen Weiss used the term Godhead in reference to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Also, in reference to Christ alone, and equally accorded to the Holy Spirit alone also. By using this term, she asserts of the equality of the nature, attributes, fullness, essence of the three persons of one God. This is reflected in our fundamental belief, number two, the Godhead. Let's look at our fundamental belief, number two, the Godhead. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever present. He is yet known through his self-revelation. He is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. That's our belief. So, when we interpret what uh, what, we, what is the issue, especially the Holy Spirit? Let's look at the belief first. But the question, how the Godhead is revealed in the Bible? We'll discuss it later. Let us turn to a lesser light first on this term, Godhead. Godhead on the edgy white theological understanding. She means Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She said, the Godhead was stirred with a pity for the race. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. Here we see Ellen White is putting on co-equal, co-existence, and all the attributes of divinity put it in a balance, solid Godhead. Express it in another way because Ellen White knew enough that her husband, James White, was not a Trinitarian. James White, coming from Christian connection, is not yet purged, did not yet understand about the personality and divinity of the Holy Spirit. So Ellen White is using terms 
which could be understood by many members by refusing the word Trinity, although the concept is, is there, clear. So, in cooperation with the three highest powers, we are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three powers will work through us in making us workers together with God. So clear, Godhead, describe the equality of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their divinity. In Christ's object lesson, 115, in him is gathered all the glory of the Father. This is Jesus. The fullness of the Godhead. He is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person. The glory of the attributes of God is expressed in his character. Clear, crystal clear. In him dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Acts of the Apostles 4.73. So, let's go to number three. Godhead ascribed to the Holy Spirit only. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. Again, in Evangelism 6.17, the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Clear. Why is it that those critics, that the Holy Spirit is not divine, is not a person, will intentionally omit this one? This is clear. And so, there is unity and solidarity of understanding in the above view of the Godhead in the Bible, the Adventist belief. The writings of Ellen White are solid in unity of understanding the revelation of the Godhead, one God in three distinct persons. As such, it means that divinity and personality of the Holy Spirit and His work could be defended in the Word of God as revelation of God. Even the Holy Spirit's omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence are revealed in God's Word. In reading the Bible, the context of the passage, meaning what is said before and after should be taken into a serious consideration in understanding the biblical writers why he refers only to God the Father, Father and Son, and the Holy Spirit, Father and Son, Father and Spirit, Christ and Spirit, as not to miss the entire message being revealed in a given passage. I want to divert a little. Because the present problem today in our church of the divinity and personality of the Holy Spirit, both from the Bible and spirit of prophecy, are the result of selected reading certain quotations and texts and subjective interpretations. Critics of the divinity and personality of the Holy Spirit are selective in the reading. Both the Bible and spirit of prophecy. Such mindset, the consequence is great. Subjective and disastrous. Critics intentionally omitted the above references. They have a website. In fact, I look at that. That they present, they present only the Father and the Son. And those quotations that contains Spirit or Holy Spirit are intentionally omitted. Is this a justifiable act of distorting the corpus of the entire AG view on the subject? These are the critics' arsenal. Why is it the arsenal? Because they gather all the quotations from Ellen White. The Holy Spirit is absent. 
And they don't get the whole thing. They quote what is in their mindset such quotation below, which they capitalize terms for emphasis such as the following line. God informed that Satan that to his son alone, he would reveal his secret purposes. And he required of the family of heaven, even Satan, to yield to him implicit and questionable obedience. And then they make their all capital letters. Only two beings to convince the reader in their websites. Can anyone consider the condensation of the Son of God preparing the gospel feast and its great cause and the invitation slightingly? No man nor ever the highest angel can estimate the great cause. It is known only the Father and the Son. Only two beings. What a selection. The only being who was one with God lived in the law of humanity. To be only two beings. Satan informed that his son alone would reveal the secret of his purposes. In other part of science of the times. Only two beings. Wow. What a selection. What about this? You only, people only, critics only get something which suit to their own interpretation. Subjective. Why not read this one? The Godhead was stirred with the pity of the race. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit gave themselves the Godhead. The three highest power, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Why remove the third? There is a hidden agenda with that. Let me now go. The first revelation of the Godhead. And I called it the oneness of God. Not like the theological books. I already explained this term in the use of my presentation. Let us consider oneness revelation of God. Since common knowledge, we will deal it very brief. Then proceed to the Trinity's revelation as outlined earlier. We find here in John, right? 17.3, the only true God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us, there is one God, the Father. Galatians 3.20, but God is one. Ephesians 4, 6, one God and the Father of all. 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God. Here are the texts where a lot of students come to my house and say, You know, Pastor, there is only one. Why there is two and three? They have misunderstood. So I have to explain it for several days. And they are so eager and energetic. That's the first one. The second is I call the Trinity of God because there are so many who are allergy with the word Trinity because of pagan. It is Catholic. Wrong. Before this term, there is already the concept. The most important is the concept rather than the words. Although the words is important also, but if you don't like the words, fine. So, the Trinity, meaning to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because I found a lot of texts. In fact, I just limit where Jesus, Spirit, the Father are referred to in a given passage of the scripture. And it is intentional. That's the, how the writer intended to be. So look at this in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Here we find Jesus, we find the Spirit, and the voice, this is my beloved child. Who is that? Look at the Father. And Jesus says in Matthew 12, If I cast them on by Spirit of God and the kingdom of God, it's clear, three. 
I can give you a lot. The Holy Spirit, my beloved Son, the Holy Spirit, the Father, my name, all these references, a lot of them, we ignore. That's why I want to discuss, when we discuss the problem of Trinity, we gather all the texts rather than blah, 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 blah. Because we are not studying. We are only entertaining with our own thinking. Rather than go to the direct word of God, the revelation of God, and study. This is the reason why. We're talking so much. Rather, consulting the authority, the revelation of God. Look at again. Again. I just posted almost more than 20 passages. Now let's go to the third. So, in the first, only one God. The second, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the tone is of God. In this context given passages, we find only Father and Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is not included. Look, you find it repeatedly. Romans 1.7, 1 Corinthians 1.3. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 2 and 3. Galatians 1, 3. And in fact, you can find him almost in Paul's first opening of his greetings of all his epistles. There are reasons why. There are biblical and theological reasons why they are written so. If you do not know the reason, keep quiet. Rather than make confusion. Because that's what Ellen White says. If you don't understand, silence is golden. Rather than talking that is rubbish. I'm using vigorous language. Look at this one. Ephesians 2, 1, verses 2 and 3. Our God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 2. God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is the Holy Spirit? Intentionally left out by the author because there is a biblical purpose for that. Again, how would you remove that? Such data? The Bible says two or three witnesses is enough. I have provided a lot of texts to witness that this is the revelation. Okay? Father and Son. Again, father and son. References now change. Revelation of Tony's of God has a biblical reason why the Holy Spirit is omitted. We have shown in several texts revelation of one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The biblical writers have a purpose why it is so in that revelation. In the revelation of one God into two persons, father and son, exactly has the same purpose or intention. Readers should discover what is or what are theological intentions or purposes of the revelation rather than jump directly into a dangerous conclusion. Now we look at the two other revelations of God. The two-ness means the father and spirit Christ and Spirit. Meaning to say, in these given passages, Jesus is not included. Only the Father and Spirit. And there is also passages where the Father is not included, only Christ and Spirit. Meaning to say, we have taken the whole corpus of the Bible that deals with the same subject. We are not biased. And so let's see. Look at here. Luke eleven thirteen. The Father and Holy Spirit. Where is Christ? Acts five twenty three. It mentions the Spirit and God. The Spirit and God. John three five. It says also in Romans five. Repeated. God, Holy Spirit, Spirit Himself, God, the Spirit and God. Repeated in Romans chapter eight. Why deny such revelation? Again, 
We find in Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 15, 20. We find it in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5. We find it in 1 John 3, 4. Where is Jesus? The writer has a purpose why they have written that. We need to discover. Rather jump into a conclusion which is, not so, which is so premature. The revelation of the toneness of God. Now, Christ and Spirit, the Father is not included. Look at that in Matthew 12, 31 and 32. You find it in Acts 2, 38 and 39. We find it long list of licks, back and forth. Spirit, Jesus Christ, Spirit, Jesus, the Spirit, and Christ, Spirit, and Christ. Why select only the two, Father and Son? That is not the whole. The revelation, look at again. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 15 and 17. Spirit and Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18. The Lord, that is Jesus, and the Lord is the Spirit. Only two. Again, in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 11, the Father is not included there, only Christ and the Spirit. So, let me put into a synthesis. When we read the Bible with an attitude and mindset of selective rather than getting the whole picture, the problem begins. The five ways of revelation that I use in this study I suggest that must be studied in their connection and interconnection as not to miss the mosaic of revelation. Rather than selective fragmentary, the rationale behind is that I stand on a theology that there is no such thing as in the Bible contradict itself on the presupposition that there is only one author of the Bible and that is God. This is pointed by Ellen White. She said, different forms of expression are employed by different writers. Open, the same truth is more extremely presented by one than by another. And several writers present subject and their varied aspects and relation. There may appear, what's that? There may appear to the superficial, careless, prejudice reader to be discrepancy or contradiction. And those critics who cannot see the divinity and personality of the Holy Spirit, you are careless, superficial, prejudice. Because the next statement, where the thoughtful, reverend student with a clearer insight discerns underlying harmony. Great controversy. Introduction, page 6. It's very clear. If God is the author of the Bible, he does not contradict. We need to dig deeper to find how to harmonize it. Because God is the author, is not the author of confusion. Because this is what I believe. The Holy Spirit reveals God the Father. According to 1 Corinthians 2.10. But God revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Only one text is enough. If we believe the Bible as the Word of God, the final authority. Who knows the deep things of God? The Holy Spirit. Why He knows? Because He is God. He's not hanging. He's not a wind. Those are metaphorical expression of different functions. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit testify or witness its others according to John 15, 26, 1 John 5, 7 to 9. Jesus claims that the Father who sent me testify of me. The Holy Spirit testify or witness to God the Father. Romans 8, 16. The Father testify to the Holy Spirit. Clear. Balance. We must understand God's modus operandi of revelation. The word which you hear is not mine, Jesus says, but the Father who sent me. All the things I heard from my Father, I made known to you. 
That is, I reveal it to you. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all the truth. Can a God, not a God, can guide into all the truth? Think. He will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things the Father are mine. Therefore, I said, He the Spirit will take mine and declare it to you. So the modus operandi is simple. From the Father, pass to the Son. And whatever has in the Father from the Son, everything from the Son is taken by the Holy Spirit. And He declares to His people. This clear modus operandi of revelation of who God is. Now, let me talk, go. Because what I have presented is the New Testament. Now, let's go to the oneness, the twoness, and the threeness of God in the Old Testament. Again, there's a lot of text I just put because I don't need to repeat a lot. I have already given Isaiah 44, you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Oh, oneness of God. Isaiah 45, 5, I'm the Lord. There is no other. Psalms 86, 10, for you are great, do wondrous things. You are alone our God. Nehemiah 9, 6, you are alone our the Lord. Come on. Both Old Testament. A New Testament. Let's go to Tunis. Moses and his people saying, Where is he who brought them out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within? And the Spirit of the Lord, you are our Father. Prophet Isaiah is recapitulating the event in Exodus. We find there two persons. Again, in the Old Testament, if you read these passages in Ezekiel, the activity of God and the Spirit is going on side by side with Ezekiel. Ezekiel 3, 16 to 23 says, Now it come to pass that at the end of the seven days that the word of the Lord came to me. The Lord. Then the Spirit entered me and sit on my feet and spoke with me and said to me, Go shut yourself inside the house. And you, O son of man, surely they will put ropes on you and bind you with them so that you cannot go out among them. Did you see? The Spirit speak the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and he said to me, Speak, thus says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord. Says the Lord God, back and forth, take turn. We look at again in 2 Samuel. There are passages in the Old and New Testament that the Lord and Spirit speak side by side. They take turn. We look at two examples. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me by me. His word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Side by side. So, you shall fall by, word, by, by sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel. Look at. So, we can see the same pattern in the book of Revelation. That the message of truth comes from the Father to Jesus, then to the Holy Spirit. God the Father occasionally not included only Jesus and Spirit. But after Revelation 5, Father and Son, Holy Spirit, there is some pattern of the modus operandi of communication that is also a revelation. Look this one. The Bible is so consistent that God in his word reveals himself. The Bible reveals one God, the Father. It reveals to the Father and Son. It reveals Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it reveals Father and Son, Father and Spirit, and Jesus in Spirit. That is consistent. I demonstrated that. Look at the church, seven churches. Many of us think that only Jesus, because we are blinded by supernatural enemy that we cannot read properly. 
Look at that. Jesus, He spoke. At the end, the Spirit, He who has ear, let Him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What Jesus instructed, evaluation of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, the same messages that the Holy Spirit has to say. What is the communication? Look again. The same pattern. Until the end. Can we reject and deny such revelation? So, the trinity of revelation of God in the Old Testament, it is well known that Trinity Godhead is explicit in the New Testament, but implicit in the Old Testament. This is true in the book of Isaiah. I finished oneness, twoness, now let's go to Trinity. Look carefully. Observe. Here is my servant, the Father, whom I, that's the Father, my chosen one, that is Jesus, whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nation. God the Father is speaking about his son to whom he will give his Holy Spirit. Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, quoted by Christ in Luke 4 verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord God, that is the Father, is on me, Christ. Trinis. So the trinity of revelation of God in the Old Testament, when we look carefully in the commissioning of Isaiah, it reads, Then I heard the voice of the Lord, singular. Whom shall I sin? Who will go for us? Just imagine from singular to plural. But look. And now the Lord God, the Father, and His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, has sent me. Isaiah 48, 16. So, full bloom. Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 10. It is the clearest idea of three persons in one God. The Lord, for he said, surely they are my people, so he become their savior. And the angel of the Lord said them, and that's Jesus, in his love and his pity, he redeemed them. But they rebuild and grieved his Holy Spirit. Clear. What glasses are you using for reading? So, the tone is formula, father and son. Why it is so rampant, prevalent? Because the father and son appears most, especially in Pauline writings. It appears that those passages directly, the Holy Spirit, is left somewhere in the corner. It is really a divine revelation and inspiration. And with theological intention, the Tony's formula does not nullify the threeness of God, the oneness of God. So, how shall we resolve the biblical theological problem? The answer are found in the questions why Jesus came and his highest priority of his mission on earth in which the whole universe is waiting and watching. I hope you understand that. Within three years of studying the problem of the Holy Spirit, I found the answer. So, let me give the answer. But before that, here is Ellen White says, because our understanding of salvation is too human-centered. For God so loved the world, only this world, this lacking, reading, understanding. Remember that before this world was created, there was already a problem in heaven. One of his best angels with mystery revealed against God. And so Ellen White says, the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than salvation of man. Listen. 
It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. But before all the universe, it would justify God and His Son in dealing with the rebellion of Satan. We need to understand. It's not human-centered, world-centered. Because before Adam and Eve were created, before the fall, there was already a big problem. And through the mission of Jesus Christ, he was sent, repeatedly used, I was sent, I was sent to declare, to reveal the Father his will. Because through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the accusation of the enemy, which the whole universe are witnessing, the unfallen world, Jesus did it all. Did it all. So it's not only for human. This human-centered understanding of salvation. We look at it in a universal context. The whole universe. The unfallen world. And so, the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven, according to Revelation 12, verses 7 to 12, and Ezekiel 28, 12 and 19, together with the angel, he deceived God's character, has been questioned and maligned, and his government and authority. The fall of man is part of the constitutive, deceptive plan of the devil to destroy to misrepresent God's character and to thwart his law, his government, and authority. Thus, in the eternal counsel of the Godhead, it is Christ through his incarnation, perfect life of obedience and character and sacrificial death would demonstrate the fullness of God's character, law and authority would reveal to the entire universe that the accusation proved wrong. With this truth, human salvation is essential and integral plan in the purpose why Jesus became God-man. It's so deep. Jesus repeatedly, the Father sent me. You never heard that voice. You have never seen him. So, he says, that is his highest mission. The entire universe is not only on planet Earth. My father's business. I come down. He sent by my father to do his will. He's doing the father's business. I can give you a lot of texts. Where only father and son. And if you read this, you will discover why there is only father and son in many of Pauline epistles. But the number one reason why Jesus came to this planet first, people do not know him. They claim God, 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 but they do not know him. That's what Jesus says. And I can back up that with one chapter. You read John chapter 8 and you will find their ignorance, but they claim to be full of understanding and wisdom. Here, reasons why revelation, father and son, this is outside the gospel. In fact, I read 100 texts and it gives me 100 reasons why Jesus came. Our memory verse, what we know only, for God so loved the world. We don't need to say, study theology seminary to study that. Even those who do not study can memorize that for God so loved the world. Let's search the scriptures, the hundreds of reasons why Jesus came. I have no time to discuss that. So the highest priority of Jesus' mission 
In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets and many times in various ways. But in his last day, he has spoken to us through his son because Jesus is the spokesperson of God, the Father as a hub, highest priority in his mission to reveal who the Father is. Why? Previous revelations about God, his character, his government, and dealing with men were insufficient. In Jesus, the fullness of revelation of God is perfect because he is the express image of everything who is God the Father is. That's what Jesus says. You have never heard his voice. Never seen his form. No one seen God at any time. Only the begotten son. That's why I'm here to reveal, to declare it. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you. That is the highest priority of Jesus. To make known, to reveal who is God, his character, his government, and his everything. There is no other. And part of the, pa of the package, the pa the, the thing, of the integral part is the salvation of the fallen man. So, consideration of all revelation of the Godhead. The oneness, the trueness, and the trinity revelation of God. Demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God. It is consistent revelation from the Old and New Testament. The oneness of God does not destroy, in any way negate or exclude, the trueness revelation of the Godhead. Father and Son, Father and Spirit, and Christ and Spirit. Neither the trueness revelation of God destroys both the oneness and the trueness revelation. They are all inclusive. Thus, the denial of one in terms of nature is in and attributes personality, it repudiates all. So, we have to understand our limitation of our human knowledge about God. There is so much we would like to know about God, but our finite minds cannot comprehend it. We are not free to create God in our own image loosely, for this would destroy the revelation of God. The triunity sets the limits for human speculation. According to Ellen White, no finite mind can fully comprehend the character of God. To the mind, the strongest and the most highly cultured, as well as the weakest and the ignorant, that holy being must remain clothed in mystery. The word of God, like the character of the author, present mystery can never be fully comprehended by finite beings. So we conjecture. We make human construction in our own bias and prejudice, and we distort the truth. Men cannot by searching find out God. This problem has not given to human beings. All that man needs to know and can know of God has been revealed in his word. Revelation. This is the problem of revelation and inspiration, which much have been neglected. So negating the attributes of the Holy Spirit destroy the revelation of the Godhead. The Spirit is eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He is life. He is truth. This is now his personality. He convicts. He sanctifies. He directs. He transforms. He teaches. He inspires. He leads. He intercedes. He generates. He anoints. He seals. These are all inclusive attributes of the members of the Godhead. God's attribute had been related to his economy. The Father is the one who plans. The Son is the one who accomplishes. The Spirit is the one who applies it all. And so, let's look at this. Jesus declared, that God the Father is a spirit, referring to God the Father. And Paul says, regarding Jesus, that the Lord is a spirit. Whenever there is spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. Christ is a spirit. To Paul, the nature of the Father and the nature of Christ and the Holy Spirit are the same. Spirit. For the spirit searches all things, is the deep things of God. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God because by nature and attribute, 
an essence and everything. The Holy Spirit is God. Nature, the nature of Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men have a fanciful view. They bring together passages about Scripture, put human construction on them. But the acceptance of this view will not strengthen the church. Such mystery, which are too deep for human understanding, silent is golden. When we do not know, we keep quiet. So that Proverbs say, if you keep quiet because you are a fool, they think you are wise. But once you open your mouth, your foolishness is revealed. God sent many of his messengers and prophets before the coming of Jesus to prepare people home everything Jewish religious life foreshadowed. When he came and lived among them, doing God's work, even his disciples was with him, did not understand who Jesus was and who the Father is, much more with the Holy Spirit due to their unbelief. Just imagine three years in the seminary of Jesus, three unhappy years, they nurture unbelief rather than belief. Luke 24, 5, Christ revealed who is God in his person in the incarnate God, the Emmanuel, so with the Holy Spirit. After his ascension, when the Holy Spirit came down, that was the time they understood who Jesus is and the Father. For the Holy Spirit enlightened their minds and gave them correct understanding. Although before the ascension of Jesus, he already opened their minds to understand the scripture. Luke 24, 45. It took Jesus more than three years before he opened their minds. Because unless Jesus did open it, still they are blinded with so many things about him and his scripture. For God cannot give the light of truth in a lump sum way. It must be by process and give it in a present route. Like the early Adventists. They have only five pillars at the beginning. And it followed during the Dark Ages because in every age there were witness for God. Men who cherished faith in Christ. Who held the Bible as the only rule of faith. Not personal subjective philosophy, logic and human reasoning. God has prepared the Waldenses, the Albergenses, the Anabaptists. They have the truth. Not all whole truth. Piece by piece. People like Wycliffe, Hoss, Jerome, Calvin, Luther, Melanchthon, and others. The remnant of God. And when they were persecuted, finally they landed in the land of America and God. So it was time that all those who bring the truth of salvation will be merged and there was the second wave of awakening and Adventism was born and yet they only have five pillars. Because God does not give a lansom of light of truth. Because light is, can be blind, can blinded us. And so later, 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 do you remember our history, 1888? That's the time we understand the doctrine of salvation. We need to look at it. And there are so many questions. Why? Either our pioneers were right or we are wrong. That's a wrong statement. The correct statement is, where is the truth? It's in the Bible, not in the pioneers. Because the pioneers, many of them died, did not yet fully recover the lost truth that was covered under the rubbish of error. We need to understand that. Then the final remnant emerged. They recovered the precious truth of salvation under the rubbish and the file of errors. So with Adventism today, we need to do our job faithfully continuing, quarrying the precious gems and separate from the dross of error, not only the doctrine of revelation of God, but all truth in his word. I want to conclude. The Holy Spirit, divinity and personality and his function. In the economy of God was not a problem at Pentecost, where a total of 15 nations gathered together. 
the issue was speaking in tongues. And in fact, I was so amazed. From Genesis to Revelation, there is no question about Trinity, about oneness and the plurality of God. There was no question. In fact, the Holy Spirit has been poured out after 50 days when Jesus went to heaven. Years later, he visited the church of Ephesus. And he asked the disciples, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to Paul, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. It's not a problem. There was no dispute. So Paul laid his hand on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with thanks and they prophesied. It was the problem both all the New Testament writers. The writers were consciously aware of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No single text hinted that it was an issue. It becomes an issue when human philosophy, logic, reasoning try to control and dominate and dethrone the revelation of God. Human construction. I want to end, but not yet. Ellen White has 10,431 paragraphs on the topic, the Holy Spirit. Do the critics read 100 paragraphs? Are they not selecting, misusing, abusing, distorting the truth? Misrepresenting both the Bible and spirit of prophecy? I'm just asking. You build your own theology with two or three or more, not the whole. We can do nothing about the truth. But the truth, but for the truth, you will know them by their fruits. You start to criticize the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who makes us a Christian. It is the Holy Spirit who prepares us for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But the problem is that of our narrow thinking, the Holy Spirit is a wind. The Holy Spirit is an influence. The Holy Spirit is an energy. It is an emanation. Can these things change us? Paul says, he sanctifies us. He intercedes with us with the Father. Can these things be used? Or be executed by not a person, by not a God? My brothers and sisters, it's time to return to the Bible. It's time to return to the authority of God. Many of us problem with us were scholars. We tend to trust scholars that they are the authority. I'm not against scholars, I'm one of them. But let us return. My fellow pastors and theologians, the final authority is not the scholars. It is the word of God in which each of us is responsible in the day of judgment what we have done. The authority is in his word because his word is eternal. All temporal is not an authority. Let's go back to the authority of God. Let's look at the fullness of revelation of God. Because when we understand there is a joy, there is rejoicing, excitement, learning. But we know what Ellen White says. Reading the Bible is just like finding a treasure. You need to work hard because a text is like a diamond. You get only the gem when you do and spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours spending with the author and the finisher of our faith. This is my prayer.
Thank you.